Ich will den Kapitalismus lieben, weil so viel für ihn spricht. Ich will den Kapitalismus lieben, aber ich schaffe es einfach nicht. Das liegt wahrscheinlich. Ja, wir sprechen mit Hillary Wainwright aus Großbritannien. Eine für mich derjenigen Frauen, die am stärksten Aktivismus, Bewegung und Wissenschaft zusammenbringen seit vielen, vielen Jahren. Sie hat eine lange Bewegungsgeschichte von der zweiten Frauenbewegung angefangen, über das, die Arbeit in London Council mit Ken Livingston, bis zu immer wieder neuen Organisierungen in Gemeinden, in, aber auch international. Sie arbeitet zum Beispiel für das Transnational Institute und sie ist Herausgeberin der Zeitschrift Red Pepper, die ich nur jedem wärmstens empfehlen kann. Und wir fragen sie heute äh, hier bei Blockupy Frankfurt äh, über einen neuen Bewegungszyklus und das Verhältnis äh, zwischen den alten, alten neuen und ganz neuen Bewegungen. Hillary, please tell us something about this new uh, cycle of movements. We have a strange relation between new movements and the old movement and the new old movements like the auto globalization movement what's their relation to one another yes maybe we need a quick summary and graph of the different phases although there have been many breaks and discontinuities as well as continuities between in a way beginning with the late 60s and 70s without being nostalgic um, and the student movement then and the women's movement most crucially in my opinion um, and the ecological movement in the late 70s early 80s and then a period of um, well right-wing reaction and so on and then we had the emergence of the alter globalization movement with Seattle and so on and then in a way a period that 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 moved into a different cycle that we now see in evidence in the squares in syntagma in Athens in um, Madrid and Barcelona and then in St Paul's and in Wall Street and I think the most striking thing for me as a 68er somebody from the uh, movements of that period influenced most perhaps most practically by the women's movement and being involved in that but so what's striking about the new movements is the sense in which they've taken forward and made more confident more practical more um, visionary ideas that were beginning to emerge in the 60s and 70s. In particular, a kind of assertion of um, capacity, of, of um, cultural equality, um, which in a way it must be distinguished between the kind of traditions of reform of the old, old movements. I mean, with all respect to them, you know, the movement, the old labor movement, the movement that produced the welfare state, Those were all movements that believed in social and economic equality, but believed they should be, those equalities should be delivered you know, by progressive governments, by socialist governments, to the people. You know, that the expertise about what the people needed lay with the professional politicians, the progressive civil servants, the academics and so on. Whereas now, and I think this began with the late 60s, there's a, a sense of you know, we have the capacity, the people have a cultural capacity. So a demand and a, a practice of cultural equality as well as social and economic equality. And that now is much more developed than it was in the 60s and 70s. So you see in Syntagma Square, you know, the, the, um, the organization of new kinds of democracy. Um, you see, when I went to Barcelona, I was really moved by the demonstration on May the 15th last year. Um, when uh, you know people were, were uh, demonstrating and then ending the demonstration, not with political leaders making demands on governments, but people actually doing things for themselves. Like in this instance, well actually this was the October demonstration, when people ended up, some planting a garden, which was then distributed round to community gardens in different parts of Barcelona's, Barcelona, others occupied houses, empty houses, and that became the base for rehousing homeless people. Others occupied a hospital that was being closed down. So all practical forms of not just occupying, but also a kind of self-government in practice. Um, so I think that's one important thing. I think the other thing concerns uh, knowledge, which is, again, in a way it's related, uh, which is that there's a sense in which people, um, I mean, now the internet makes it hugely more possible, share knowledge, exchange ideas, develop programs, policies, alternatives in a horizontal kind of way. I mean, sometimes this is 
talked about as if it's completely new and it's the internet that has led to it. But actually, no, the internet has been a tool that has massively escalated it and helped to make it truly international. But the cultural concept of working collaboratively, horizontally, is something that I think began in the late 60s and the 70s. So potentially, you know, there's a, 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 an incredibly creative possibility of the earlier generations um, working and learning from the new. Um, I mean, there's been that process of rupture and defeat um, that was most directly experienced in Britain with Thatcher. And that was also, we have to acknowledge, a, a period of, of, of capitalist expansion. In a sense, capitalism ex appropriated and drew on many of the creative energies of the movements. And I, I think that's also got to be uh, recognised because um, sometimes uh, we talk about a crisis as if we're all in crisis, but actually we've got to think, what is it that's in crisis? I mean, we, the people, can still invent, create, care, educate. You know, we still got our capacities. It's true that we're not often being allowed to um, deploy them, you know, in a paid way, but we've got our creativity. It's the financial system, you know, that's in crisis. <laughs> it's as if that tower is crumbling. And so we've got to really build on that that creative capacity of, of, of labour in a broad sense, not just in the workplace, but in society and in communities. That's got to be the basis of the way forward and the alternatives. And how is it in Great Britain? We have a situation that we have a lot of fantastic student strikes. Uh, the unions got more militant and going to strike. And we have had riots. Of course, the government is not changing. But how is uh, the left in uh, Great Britain organizing themselves? What you, what's the perspective? Yes, I don't think we should be too optimistic. I mean, there are huge problems. I mean, you know, we have the weight of very um, established institutions, established in the sense that a lot of vested interests so very slow to move. Uh, and this applies to the trade unions, you know, as much as to the, to the state institutions. But I think that, that public opinion is, is on the move. I mean, we saw this with the health service, you know, that... The mass of people were completely against the bill that effectively, if it was followed, would le mean the dismantling of the health service, which is like a sort of uh, an exemplar of public services, of, of treating public services as a common. Um, and I think that public opinion was partly awakened and activated by actions like Occupy, by the actions of the um, students. And so what we're seeing is a lot of new relationships developing. You know, the, the, the state is doing its best to isolate the students and the um, activists. A lot of criminalization, you know, people being put into prison for no good reason. You know, a lot of... A lot of yeah, exactly, yes. A lot of um, fear. I mean, you can see it here, an attempt to, to create an atmosphere of, of fear that divides what they think of as the hardcore activists from the mass of concerned people um, but I don't think this is working I mean uh, for instance things are happening which never happened you know when I was a young activist which is that the trade union movement is really opening up to links with the uh, direct action movement UK Uncut which is a very imaginative movement I mean what it does is um, focus on you know the the, the, the businessmen mainly but not exclusively and women you know who are evading tax And then to focus, to name them, shame them, occupy their shops and the places they own and illustrate what could be done with the money that they're just pocketing. So Boots, the pharmacist, owned by one of these tax evaders, has been occupied regularly, you know, and people dress up as nurses and, and, and show the kind of spending that could be happening on houses, uh, on hospitals rather, or they occupy uh, um, other buildings and say, you know, this, is, this could be a library, you know. Um, so now the unions are making direct links with, with, with them and realising that, that the organising that the unions are good at in the workplace and, and uh, in particular you know, uh, isn't enough, that there needs to be this wider um, kind of militancy and imaginative militancy to reach people who are not organised in the trade union movement. So I, I think that those relationships are developing and that's important. I think that there's a kind of um, 
anger and a feeling that this government is in Britain is, is illegitimate. You know, it's, it's doing things which have not had any electoral mandate. So now with the health service, you know, which was never, it was never in Cameron's election or Clegg's election manifesto to dismantle, privatise the health service. Now, on the contrary, they would always say, you know, I swear by my, my heart, you know, that I will never dismantle the health service. Now they're doing it. So people, doctors, you know, just are, are going to refuse. There's going to be a very intransigent movement. Um, and I think that around the health service, but I think that's like a, a thin end of the wedge because I think the health service illustrates the principle of organising spheres of society according to public need and public good and not the market. And if that movement can be effective on the health service, people will begin to you know, pick it up and accept public need as a basis of a good economy. Any thanks to you. Ich will den Kapitalismus lieben, weil so viel für ihn spricht. Ich will den Kapitalismus lieben, aber ich schaffe es einfach nicht.